Sidewalk Labs is this amazing opportunity to bring a bunch of technologists together with a bunch of urbanists to take advantage of the amazing things that technology has to offer with a deep understanding about what really makes cities tick. Instead of saying a problem is just about technology or it's just about policy, in most cases the answer is it's both. We find the very best people in the world who can go and think about solving those types of problems. Uh, our next speaker is Aaron Trushel. He joins us uh, as Director for Strategy and Analytics at the Camden Coalition in New Jersey. Uh, the Camden Coalition is probably all of you know here, pioneered the hotspotting approach to healthcare that uses data to target patient populations uh, where preventive measures might have their, their greatest impact in local communities. And Aaron oversees applied data and research activities at Camden, including an integrated data system of health and social service data. So uh, please welcome with me Aaron Trushel. Good evening, everyone. I'm um, really excited to be here tonight. I think Lawrence talk gave a really you know, good macro level argument for why social determinants are important to pay attention to. And my hope is to show you at the micro level and you know, what kind of you know, things are possible when you bring partners together and let data um, you know, bring together coalitions of you know, non-traditional partners. So before I you know, dive into the weeds on the data side, I want to tell a little bit of a you know, truncated story of our organization's history. So um, about 15, 20 years ago, um, a man named Jeffrey Benner moved to Camden. He was a family uh, doc who just left residency. He wanted to work in an underserved community. He wanted to live there. And so he opened his own primary care practice. Um, you know, multiple years of running from room to room, getting reimbursed uh, you know, $20, $30 for 15 minute, you know, seemingly meaningless uh, increments of time and engaging with patients and his practice perennially being on the verge of bankruptcy and struggling. Um, you know, he became extremely infuriated just about the nature of what healthcare looked like and more bleak about um, what a, a, prim a primary care practice could look like in this kind of setting. Meanwhile, the um, healthcare systems around him, the hospital systems were building fancy new facilities, new emergency, emergency rooms, and that kind of outrage you know, led him to bring together the primary community provider and start an organization called the Canyon Coalition of Healthcare Providers. So we started as an informal support group for all the practicing primary care docs, you know, regular breakfast meetings come together, um, build relationships with one another, and over time it formalized into a much larger organization. So we're now a community accountable care organization that brings together all the local health systems in Camden, New Jersey, all the primary care practices, um, social service and other um, community providers as well, um, as well as community representing organizations under this community accountable care organization framework. Um, so, um, as I said, you know, Jeff was running from room to room, getting paid twenty dollars, thirty dollars for a, a visit. Um, one of our first efforts was to bring together the three hospital systems that are in Camden to get access to their administrative level data, so their billing data. So, anytime someone came to the hospital, you know, a bill gets submitted. Um, that data usually just lives for financial purposes or for you know business improvement. Um, we tapped into that underlying data to tell a story of what population health looks like in a city like Camden. Um, so we took individual level data um, from across these different health systems, health systems that his historically you know, competed, didn't have a very uh, adversarial relationship with one another, um, and brought that together to tell a citywide story. Um, so once we did that, it was even more infuriating you know, from the perspective of a struggling family doc. We saw that on a yearly basis, we're spending over $130 million on hospital-based care for a city of 77,000 people. We're seeing over half the population come into contact with the hospitals, whether it's for an ED visit or for an admission. And more importantly, we're seeing a high degree of overlap across these systems where individuals are bouncing across not just one health system, but multiple health systems, uh, creating more and more opportunity for fragmentation and disjointed care. Um, what became uh, now, you know, as part of the common knowledge, is this idea of the Pareto curve, of our costs being highly concentrated. You know, the 80-20 rule, that 20% of our patients comprise 80% of our costs. We became really fascinated on who are the 1% of the most expensive patients, what's driving that trend, how do we get to engage those individuals and better meet their needs and hopefully bring down costs. 
Um, this is just a sample anonymized case study of one of those people that um, is in our 1%. So this is one person's timeline over five years, and you can see each of those bars represents an encounter with the healthcare system. So if it's red, it's an emergency department visit, an inpatient visit being blue. You can see a constellation of different diagnoses, um, social, behavioral health um, diagnoses coming into play, lots of medical complexity. Um, this is really a you know, tragic tale of a healthcare system that's not bending to meet the needs of a very complex individual, and in the meantime, costing lots of money and lots of expense at the individual and system level. So we started to look at, you know, what do those individuals look like in the aggregate? What are the driving diagnoses? You know, we found that on average, um, you know, these are individuals you know, roughly 60 years old. They're spending over 50 days in the hospital in a given year, um, 75,000 ballpark in what the hospitals are bringing in. Um, we mapped them out and we were able to see that there were concentrations geographically. So we could see certain buildings were annually, you know, spending millions of dollars on their hospital-based care. And we started a whole community organizing movement around trying to get to know the people in those buildings, the support staff, so social services and elderly care buildings, um, the nursing staff in, uh, in nursing homes, um, and really starting to understand, you know, what do those transitions look like, who are the community partners that we need to engage around building out a, a more holistic healthcare system. And through that, we arrived at this idea of hotspotting, which has become ubiquitous um, ever since the Tuolumne article came out in New Yorker. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that people have operationalized or interpreted hotspotting. We like to think of it as the strategic use of data, data to target evidence-based services to complex patients um, with high utilization. And we think that that high utilization is you know, really a proxy for a mismatch between the needs of the individual and the evidence-based services that are out there. Um, and at the core of hotspotting is this idea of data and how do we you know, tap into data to understand who our patients are, um, to better you know, to target the right programs to the right individuals, to find them in a more real-time way, um, and ultimately to evaluate themselves. And so over the past five or so years, we've been building up a variety of data systems that can help support our hotspotting work. Um, so we're running a health information exchange that's pulling in real-time data from across all these health systems that I showed you. Um, we're also pulling in longitudinal administrative data from a variety of partners, starting with the hospitals, but as I'm going to talk a little bit more, branching out into social services. Um, and then we're also capturing a lot of you know, internal workflow data, capturing you know, how do we engage with individuals, how do we hold ourselves accountable. So you know, our core intervention, I'm not going to go too deep in this because Monique's going to talk a lot more about this you know, similar type of engagement framework, but on a daily basis, we have reports coming in that identify who are the people that we need to engage, what are the characteristics of them, and we can start to play a traffic controller-like perspective in steering people to various uh, interventions. Our core intervention that was the um, feature of that hotspot article is a community-based care management model. So teams of uh, nurses, social workers, uh, community health workers that um, initially engage people at the bedside, so somebody's been readmitted a few times within you know, the past six months, you know, rather than wait for them to get discharged back to the community where it's a you know, chaotic time or it's hard to find somebody, we start the relationship building right at the hospital bedside. So we walk up, we have you know, highly trained staff that are good at building relationships. Many of them are from the Camden community, um, and they start to uh, start the enrollment process and the relationship building. Once they've been discharged, then we really, you know, the crux of the intervention um, kicks in. So we have these multidisciplinary teams that go out and, you know, as Lauren was saying, you know, this care management framework needs to take into consideration the home. It can't just happen in the households. It can't happen um, with nurses in cubicles that are calling patients that may or may not have phones. Um, so our teams, you know, start the care planning at the hospital. They really then go out to the home and they start to observe and build a deeper relationship, um, you know, uh, embedded within the trauma-informed care and the patient-centered care planning approaches. Um, and start to do lots of coordination, so whether that's um, scheduling a primary care appointment and going to the primary care appointment, helping identify what social service needs they might have, um, and helping steer them to them, and really you know, building a deep relationship over a three to four month period on average. Um, and that all is sort of wrapped around this monthly case management meeting type framework where we're bringing people and partners from across the community that are interacting with our patients together to you know, talk about case studies where things went right or went wrong and learn from them. Um, and really just give, you know, give an opportunity to have a bunch of people that are all touching some of the most complex, fragile members of our community to come together and get to know one another better. Um, so really, you know, at the core of what we're doing are these 16 domains of care. So we have a very structured way of doing care planning with patients. Um, you can see from here that the majority of what we're doing with patients is non-medical. It's, it's addressing the social determinants. So 14 of these 16 domains are actually focused on the social determinants and how we actually um, improve people's you know, well-being um, more broadly than just providing you know, health care. And so 
Um, one of the things that this is all wrapped around is this idea of continuous improvement and taking advantage of all that data and um, putting it into a really business-like framework. So we, you know, in addition to having the health information exchange, we have a case management workflow database that captures a tremendous amount of data um, about how we engage with individuals, um, the outcomes and other data that we capture, we push that into dashboards that help tell us how we're performing. So this is a very process-like dashboard where we're showing our ability for each of our care teams and our care team staff to get a patient in to go out to the home within five days of their uh, discharge from the hospital, to get them a primary care visit within seven days of the hospital. We're also zooming out and looking at our aggregate impacts on are we actually reducing utilization. So this is a um, one of our dashboards that's around a certain subset of our, our um, clients who are part of our housing first program. You can see the green bar that's in the middle. Um, that's the day that we moved them in. So these are some of our highest utilizing members who um, have you know, very um, prolific histories of, of housing vulnerability um, that we've gotten into a housing first like model and we're seeing you know, pretty dramatic reductions in just the encounter rates at, at the ED and the hospital. So taking advantage of all that data that's captured on the fly and getting it back into the hands of the providers, the care teams, our management, and our other community partners. Um, one of the things that's really hard to do in this space is to show with rigor, you know, Lauren talked about the mixed results around case management, um, to show at a high level that you know, these kinds of programs are being effective, we really need to embrace more um, rigorous research that's you know, the, the gold standard for you know, drugs or biomedical devices. Um, so we partnered with JPAL at MIT to do a randomized control trial. We're actually almost there um, as far as uh, recruiting all of our uh, participants. We're going to be following people for a year, so we're really excited that you know, in the next year or so there's going to be some really great publications that come out of this. One of the things that's come out of this uh, work, though, is that you know, the healthcare side only tells so much of the story. So you know, we had for many years claims data, we had clinical data from the EMRs, um, but that only told a really limited fraction of you know, the total story that um, was emerging through our engagement with patients. And so we knew that we needed to supplement that with a whole host of other uh, data that already existed out there. So about two years ago, we started a whole effort called Canyon Rise, Administrative Records Integrated for Service Excellence where we started engaging other community partners to get their data into our orbit. So to date, we've engaged the criminal justice system, we have arrest data, we have correctional data and jail data, we've kind of partnered with the school district to bring in school data, we're working on getting access to housing data, um, and there's been a lot of really interesting applications that have come out of it, so I'm just going to briefly touch on one, and I look forward to in the panel talking about them in more detail. And so when we took the police data, which was our first um, cross-sector partnership and merge that with the hospital data. We found that a significant majority of the um, individuals who come into the police hands through an arrest are also showing up at the hospital. Um, so it, that was a surprise to us. But you know, similar to what we found with the high concentration of costs and um, encounters, we also found a very uh, uh, small subset of individuals that were responsible for a disproportionate share of both arrests and hospital visits. So this shows you, you know, the distribution of emergency department visits and arrests. We focused in on you know who are the people that are in the five percent of the distributions on both sides and what do they look like you know and, you know things that were obviously intuitive if you're in this space but until you're able to quantify it and show it it really brings a powerful argument for why we need to be investing in more um, social determinants more things around behavioral health we saw that you know extremely high rates of substance abuse mental health um, victimization so people that are showing up at the hospital as a result of violence um, homelessness so we don't actually have homelessness data feeding in yet but we're able to see through proxies individuals' addresses and other shelters, are they coming up as explicitly homeless? Um, and we're seeing all those things that destabilize individuals' well-being um, at you know, very high rates within that population. So that timeline that I showed you earlier, when we brought in the police data, we could see, okay, here's someone that you know, not only is very well known to our healthcare partners, but you know, the police have been interacting with on a, on a near regular basis. The predominant cause of those arrests were you know, mostly public nuisance and uh, related crimes, things like loitering, drinking in public. You can also see you know, an even greater picture of escalation. So individual, uh, you know, individuals coming in for very minor things, and then you can see um, the substance abuse problem picks up, and then there's um, you know, picking up uh, arrests for violence, and the police respond to an overdose. And so you know, the story becomes even more complete of not only is the healthcare system failing this individual, but the criminal justice system, which you know, treats through arrest and you know, incarceration and release, and there is no sort of therapeutic angle to it. You know, this really tells a powerful story of that failure. We've done segment analysis where we're doing clustering on you know, who are the individuals in those groups, finding some really interesting trends of different things that drive people. So when you start to include people's diagnoses, their arrest profiles, you can see that not only are, are there uh, you know, the subset of people extremely complex, but they're complex for different reasons. And we, can, we need to start using the data to understand what are those reasons and how do we um, engage those individuals in more real time and steer them to the right services. So we won't go into that part too much. 
But the most um, pertinent thing for our day-to-day -day operations is, you know, we thought that our traditional um, client was older, that you know, maybe they had some criminal justice involvement many years in their past, but they were too sick um, for getting, you know, coming into the police's orbit. Um, and what we found when we linked our own client data to the criminal justice side is that we found that um, we, our, our population had still a significant amount of contact with the criminal justice system, was coming in for predominantly you know, the low-level crimes that we don't think, you know, as a community, we should be spending our time arresting as much um, and focusing our efforts on. And most profoundly, we found that our graduation rate within this certain subset of our population that was coming into the, uh, the police's orbit was dramatically lower. So our ability to work with someone for three or four months before losing them. And so now we're under this um, you know, process of building a relationship with the police, with the jails, to think about how do we expand our model. So not just a hospital bedside, but we can now go into jails, we can enroll people in a different way. Maybe we can get the police to engage with individuals in a very different way or make referrals. Um, so there's a lot of different applications to this um, that we're excited about, and I look forward to talking to you more. Okay.